Now, just before the Premier axed Masuku, a forensic report commissioned by the MEC said it found no red flags of corruption on the part of Bandile Masuku. I'm joined now by forensic investigator Paul O'Sullivan, who did that probe. Good evening, and thank you very much for your time. First of all, just for the record, who commissioned and paid for the probe that you did? Obviously, we got instructed by a law firm. Um, it's our understanding that the law firm were instructed by the MEC for help. So he paid for this report? Well, we got paid by the law firm, and as I say, it's our understanding that he in turn was instructed by uh, the MEC for help. Right, so it seems like he paid for it. Um, uh, before we go any further into the report, people are going to say, oh, well, how independent could it be? Just tell us how independent uh, it could be, bearing in mind that it was uh, the request of the MEC. Well, um, it's like saying any report that's done by any professional firm is not independent because at the end of the day, uh, somebody has to pay for it. Uh, these things are not delivered free of charge. So unless you can get volunteers to do reports, uh, all reports will have somebody paying for them. Now, we have an, an, a range of clients that engage with us, and most of them are law firms. I mean, law firms instruct us. They instruct us because we do an independent investigation. We do not tailor our investigation to suit the client, and we do not allow our client to influence the investigation. So, um, you know, it's as independent as you can get mm. if, you're, um, mm. if you're employing a professional firm to do the investigation. Did you have any understanding that if you found against him or if you found any evidence of wrongdoing, you would absolutely put that out? We made it crystal clear that once we were appointed, it's like letting a torpedo out of a submarine tube. <laughs> there was no going back. All right. We, now, made it crystal, we made it crystal clear. Your report states you find not a shred of evidence implicating Dr. or Mrs. Masuko. Now, how deeply did you probe their accounts? You do mention lifestyle audits, but how thorough were you in, in that look into any potential wrongdoing in their accounts? We were as thorough in this investigation as we are in any investigation we do. Uh, we did not go with a light touch. It wasn't a whitewash. We dug deep. We spoke to witnesses. We interviewed a number of people. We obtained somewhere in the region about 2,000 pages of uh, documents that we plowed through. I'm satisfied that our report is rock solid and I'll stake my reputation on it. Right, so let's go into what you found a little bit in a little bit more detail. Interestingly, your report found that um, in April there was concern about irregularities around these contracts. Um, and at that point, uh, the MEC actually immediately asked for an audit. So it's not like he rested on his laurels when he heard there might be irregularities. Am I correct in my understanding of what you found there? That's correct. We. Um we are satisfied that we can prove that the MEC himself, uh, together with the then head of department, Professor Lukele, the two of them had a meeting on or about the 8th of April, and a decision was taken to have a proper audit done. And following that, I think the following week, um, Professor Lukele wrote a letter to the uh, Gauteng uh, Audit Department and requested a proper audit. Right. The, another allegation that you found in your probe not to be true is the allegation that Mrs. Masuku and Mr. Diko were in business together. They, in fact, never went into business together, though they did at one point consider it. Yeah, I think and that quite often happens that shell companies are formed with the intention of doing some or other business activity. Um, we interviewed uh, Mrs. Uh, Diko. We, we, we separately interviewed all these people. We got different uh, times and dates for those interviews, and their versions corroborated each other. Mm -hmm. Now, we also, we also investigated the company, and we were able to see that the company never opened a bank account, and it never started trading. So um, their stories are great. They were planning to open some community service with piggeries and stuff like that. It just never took off. 
One of the things that he, he did have trouble explaining to you, and I, you did put some, you put, we put the transcripts of the questions, and that was why he didn't, that he, he says he, he wasn't aware uh, that Mr. Deco's company had received a COVID tender. Um, and I'm just going to paraphrase, uh, just for speed here, um, that he simply didn't read through a list of suppliers when he passed it on to someone who had requested it. So when he was questioned by investigators and said with a lot of authority, no, I know nothing of this, he only went back through his emails and realized that he actually did have that list list and he's you know he's making the point that it was an incredibly difficult time um, people were working sort of in an emergency situation and he was getting tons of emails he missed this it was an oversight so I'm, I'm, I'm saying that it seems that he's saying it was an honest mistake he missed that and that he had no clue that his friends um, no, had received a contract am I right with that it was partly he didn't say he'd made a mistake he said he deliberately chose not to open and read the email because he understood that it was no longer necessary to do so and he was literally getting hundreds of emails every day he instructed uh, one of the employees at Gauteng Health to take care of a request by uh, a charitable yeah. foundation that wanted to assist and the, the, the instructions were handled by somebody else and when the email was sent to him he just ignored it what do you think should happen you know we've got a situation where the SIU which is still finishing its probe they haven't found corruption against him as yet but they have found that um, he broke the PFMA rule um, and that he broke the Constitution um, in in what he failed to do and and, and things that he didn't get right um, for many this is an issue of political accountability that he be fired the DA says he should never come back again even if he's found not to have been corrupt though the premier has acknowledged that he's done good work up until now um, and he may rehire him if he's found innocent of any corruption do you think it's unfair what is happening to him or do you think it is important that even if there's no corruption the issue of a political accountable society is something we need in this country well, I think absolutely. Um, you know, the taxpayers, and I'm one of them, uh, we expect government to be c accountable to the taxpayers. Um, and in this case, I, I think it's fair to say that the Premier of Gauteng has probably erred on the side of safety and said, well, look, yeah, I'm going to stand you down. Uh, let's allow the process to be completed properly. We haven't even seen the SIU report. Um, it's a very strange state of affairs because there's been a number of newspapers um, reporting on the SIU report. So you're just left wondering, what's going on here? If the report has been leaked to the media, but the person who the report is about, he's not able to get a copy of it. And I think there's something very strange going on there. And we suggested, um, <clears throat> based on the media reports, because we haven't seen the report either, but based on the media reports, there's no doubt in our mind that the media reports refer to an, a, a, a so-called SIU report. And if what the media are saying is in that report, then our statement would be that it appears that the SIU have jumped to conclusions without properly investigating the facts. So you think he should not have been fired until the SIU final report came out? Is that what you're saying? Look, I'm not a politician, thank God, you know. Yes, um, but you are a taxpayer, at the end of the say. day. And you've, you've fought yeah, a lot of dodgy people. Well, that's what I do. Yeah. Um, you know, in, at the end of the day, I have no problem um, with allowing this process to continue unfolding. I very much expect we will see a situation. Remember, the door has been left open. The Premier of Kauteng made it crystal clear that if at the final analysis, he is exonerated, he'll be given his job back. And he also said that he's not going to fill the job in the meantime. So I think what I've suggested um, to the lawyers that appointed us is that they should advise the client to sit back and wait and see what goes on and, and to also apply for a copy of this so-called SIU report, if it indeed is a report. And what I'm left puzzled by is how the SIU can issue a report when they haven't finished their investigation. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Forensic investigator Paul O'Sullivan.